Um, and I note in your course schedule that overall your course does address uh, themes of affect uh, and emotion, um, and that uh, you have been, for better or worse, subjected to some of my own readings on that. So what I wanted to do today was, in part, repeating a few things that I've said in a, in a few presentations lately. I hope there's not too many people uh, who are overlapping with that, so this won't be uh, a repeat for some of you, but I did want to emphasize, because this is a course on affect and emotion, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about what we might call the automation of affect taking place in technological worlds in general and in Japan in particular. Um, but before doing that, I thought I might um, sort of zoom out a little bit because this is a course on the anthropology of affect and emotion and the politics of that. I want to back out a little bit um, and see if it might be helpful to revisit very quickly what and why anthropologists have uh, been showing so much interest um, in affect recently, particularly in this concept called affect, which might be separated from, or as I like to think, added to the concept of emotion. And so that's where I wanted to start with us for today. So emotions and emotional expression in general have long featured as, as key elements defining cultural differences for anthropologists, um, especially in the North American tradition, as many of us know. Uh, we can obviously see this in some of the most canonical texts of Japan anthropology as well, and that's the tradition I'm coming from, um, most of my work being done in Japan. So, of course, we have Ruth Benedict's Chrysanthemum and the Sword, of course, which defined cultural difference along the lines of different patterns of personality clusters expressed through different emotion-heavy terms like uh, shame and chapter titles like the circle of human feelings. Uh, so very early on, Ruth Benedict was thinking about cultural in terms of emotion and emotionality, one might say. And then we can fast forward quite a bit and we have the anthropology in the 1970s and 80s, when anthropologists looked specifically at how emotions and the values placed on them differed culturally uh, and could be analyzed by evaluating how emotional vocabulary organized emotional life um, and emotion and reason in particular, in particular that distinction between the two differently from Euro-American traditions. And it's important to note here, I think, that this burgeoning work at the time on the emotions took place quite despite the famous British anthropologist Edmund Leach's claim in 1958 that the inner states of people should be left to psychologists while anthropologists should focus on public symbols. Now, as early as the 1970s, scholars working on Japan like Doi Takeo had already been blurring these lines between inner life on one hand and public symbols and language on the other hand, specifically with uh, words in the Japanese tradition like amai, which referred to these deeply affective bodily capacities of care and dependence, which operated in part through language and in part through things like child rearing practices um, and things which were very intimate on a, both a bodily level and a linguistic and conceptual level. So anthropologists and Japan anthropologists and scholars in particular had done quite well to show how language and culturally specific practices conditioned emotions as socially communicated feelings. Um, what they were subsequently and sometimes criticized for, however, not always fairly, I think one should add, was that this language or this discursive based approach to feeling could sometimes not very well get below the surface, um, either to the body, which was often left to biology, or to the unconscious or non-conscious realms, which was often left to psychologists, as it very much was in the British tradition. And so this is one of the main problems that I think a critical turn to affect since the 1990s has tried to address um, specifically. So while I'm definitely not going to go into the weeds of the debates and problems of affect theory, of which there are many, let me just try to state one feature of these debates in order to try to draw out how the term affect might be useful to some of us joining here to analyze contemporary technologies of affect and of what I'm calling affect automation. So in short, one popular version of affect theory 
often claims that affect is different from emotion in so much that it refers to things that are immediate, to say sensations or feelings which are immediate, automatic, sometimes non-linguistic, uh, oftentimes these very somatic changes in the body. That's the affective realm, whereas the emotional realm is more focused on the semiotic or the meaningful capture and communication of feeling or of affect. So to put it in more simple terms, if affect was that strange queasiness in the stomach, emotion was what we call and can communicate and consciously recognize as nervousness, for example. So this uh, one proposed definition of affect, which is largely attributed to the theorist, the philosopher, to be more particular, Brian Masumi, set off a whole set of debates about affect that is not worth going into here, save to say that to the degree that affect was identified with the body and the biological, it sometimes made it difficult for social scientists to develop approaches, methods, and indeed a language to describe how social and material conditions shaped not only our emotional language, but also the very somatic and reactive capacities of the body. So in short, anthropologists writing about affect today really want to understand, I certainly do, um, among other things, how one's bodily, automatic, sometimes even unconscious reactions, feelings, and habits are also, at the same time, quite variable, dynamic things that depend very much on different historical and cultural contexts. Now, why is that point or perspective important today? Well, let's look at some examples of technologies emerging today that presume to automate affect in order to help us address that question. So just a few examples that some of you may have seen before. Um, these two wristbands made by the MIT effective computing scientist Rosalind Picard and her company Empatica uh, can presumably register anxiety by measuring skin conductance, basically how much the skin, uh, the skin sweats, uh, heart rate variability, and other physiological metrics, which can better inform you of your non-conscious anxiety triggers uh, as one thing these um, wristbands can presumably do. Um, in short, or presumably I should say uh, proposed to do, in short, they can be used to kind of measure these affective changes in the body that users are not consciously aware of because they're dealing with physiological metrics which are hard to sense consciously, things like heart rate variability. Uh, here is another example. Um, certain software systems, such as those used by Aggregate IQ, which was hired by Cambridge Analytica during the Brexit campaign, some of you might remember, can now analyze the text of millions of public social media posts in a method called sentiment analysis. When this method is tied to census data, these systems can generate what's called psychographic profiling. Uh, this can be used to generate and then target certain audiences with effective political messaging, such as, for example, some of you might remember this example, one I use quite a bit recently. Uh, we send the EU 350 million pounds a week. Let's fund our NHS instead. This was this notoriously inflated slogan of the Brexit campaign. Um, this third example, and this one, just to emphasize that this is not all about scaring people here. Um, the researcher Huang Jisheng created a similar sentiment analysis algorithm system that scans Chinese social media posts for signs of suicide intentions, uh, including the over 1 million posts written to the memorial page of Li Wenbian, who first raised concerns about the coronavirus in Wuhan. This algorithm then identifies those who may be in need of immediate help. Uh, then a team of volunteers in China reaches out to about 100 people a day to offer assistance and mental health support. Uh, finally, I want to return to Japan and this camera and software system by Panasonic, which can read one's heart rate and heart rate variability by measuring light fluctuations in blood vessels in the face. Um, so it can do this just with a camera remotely. Uh, by doing so, it will then suggest um, perhaps that one is growing nervous or agitated just by their, um, their face featuring uh, in film on a camera. 
this might um, be then used, for example, in security cameras or even in the workplace to track worker happiness, uh, which is one thing Panasonic has considered, um, which is a factor, argue some companies like Panasonic do for productivity. So these are just a few examples of what I'm calling affect automated. Uh, as a researcher interested in the social effects of these emerging technologies, a first step for me in looking at these new forms of tech is to ask um, what models or theories of emotion do these technologies rely on? Um, where do they come from? What emotional models of human behavior do they operationalize? And how are they being implemented in daily life? And so that's why I've taken this, this term model, an emotional model, or uh, to flip it around a bit, model emotion as the title of a project website that I and other colleagues uh, are engaged in, particularly my colleague uh, Hirofumi Katsuno at Doshisha University in Japan. So in attempting to try to answer some of these questions, it becomes clear rather quickly that researchers and companies building these technologies do not simply rely on the latest science of emotion, as one might suspect, in building their systems. Rather, certain theories are chosen for certain reasons and specific desired applications. As you might be able to already guess, I suspect, um, what kinds of theories would be attractive to corporations building technologies to genuinely help facilitate emotional intelligence are those that are likely to appeal to a wide variety of people. Um, technologies that can read the emotions of various people accurately and that can or that uh, are reliable across many different cultural contexts or at least could be argued as reliable across many cultural contexts. So the result of this is that the theories of emotion that these companies often select to build their machines with artificial emotional intelligence are those that often subscribe to rather universal theories of human emotion, often developed, developed by Western psychologists. Uh, so let me now take us back to Japan to explore an example of this theory and how it's being implemented and put to use in a certain technology that automates affect. So this is the robot um, Paolo, or Japanese Pardo, uh, a small humanoid robot in Japan created by the software company Fujisoft. Uh, Pardo was created specifically as a communication partner for the elderly. So in this sense, its engineers imagine that Pardo will relieve the loneliness of aging parents, as well as the anxiety of their children who worry they cannot provide them with the care that's traditionally expected of them in Japan. Um, and Pararo can thus sort of carry on a basic conversation and is designed to hold the user's attention and interest. So integral to this objective, according to um, Fujisoft engineers that I spoke with in field work, is equipping Pararo with capacities to read the affective state of the user. If Pararo can sense when a user is become, becoming uneasy or unengaged in interaction, then the robot can better learn how to adjust the content of its conversation or perhaps suggest an alternative form of entertainment such as singing a song or performing a dance. Uh, and this here is how Pardo reads, quote unquote, or senses emotion. So in this photo, um, Pardo is reading my own facial expressions. Um, in the top left corner of the screen, you can see four emotions listed there. You probably won't be able to see exactly what's listed there because it's such small print. But essentially what you have listed on the screen are four emotions, uh, happiness, surprise, anger, and sadness, or what are written on the screen in Japanese as yorokobi, odoroki, ikari, and kanashimi. And so this is how Parado quote unquote sees the emotional world of people it interacts with. And this is what I call as an analytical term, a quote-unquote model emotion. So it's a model emotion because first the robot has an algorithmic model for how and when to designate a facial expression as a particular emotion, such as happiness. However, it's also a quote-unquote model emotion because second, it draws from a specific psychological model or theory of emotion in order to build that machine model on. So, we might ask then, what is this psychological model of emotion on which Pardo's 
emotion engine is based. And this is where things get very interesting for me um, and rather important to communicate this point, but it's also a really familiar point to those who have worked in this area. So I apologize if you've heard this sort of storyline before, but it's quite a good one for those who haven't. So Parado's machine model for recording emotion is based on the American psychologist Paul Ekman's theory of basic emotions. So in over 40 years of research on the expressions of the emotions, Paul Ekman developed a model of six basic emotions. Uh, sometimes it was described as nine emotions, uh, sometimes seven, but for the most part, six, that he considered were these universally identifiable emotions, which could be seen in facial expressions all across cultures. So even more important than this theory of basic emotions that Ekman uh, constructed, was in fact this rigorous coding system that he designed to render that theory readable, so to speak. So in conjunction with uh, his colleague Wallace Friesen and drawing on the work of the anatomist Carl Hermann Hutze, Ekman designed the facial action coding system, what's called FACTS for short, and using facial action units, AU in the chart that you see there, which measure minute movements of the face. Fax then provides this integrated and systematic means to code facial expression in a way that is recordable and programmable in software. So it's thus this technical system, and in turn, Ekman's model of the emotions more generally, that has become the fundamental basis for integrating many machine systems and robots with a kind of preliminary form of artificial emotional intelligence, even if a very, very basic form of it uh, right now. So Ekman's psychological model of emotion has indeed quite a global reach, as we can see here with the example of Parado. So there are several companies in North America and Europe employing this system in various affect sensing technologies, uh, companies like Affectiva, iMotions, um, uh, Emotient, which was a company that Ekman, in fact, served on the advisory board for until it was bought by Apple. And uh, you may even recognize this model of emotion from the popular film Inside Out, uh, on which Ekman was also uh, an advisor for. However, Ekman's model has also inspired the AI architectures of many humanoid and companion robots in Japan, such as the robot Afetto by Ishihara Hisashi, uh, SoftBank's companion robot, Pepper, and even Sony's pet robot, Aibo. Uh, this is the newest form of Aibo released uh, again in 2018. So in contrast to this notion of Japan being a place where unique indigenous ideas of intimate human robot relations exist, here we see the story is that, but also more complex. Um, as these ideas of human-robot relations are shaped within globally shared worlds of scientific and engineering practices. As you might uh, now see how the term affect can be conceptually useful for anthropologists here, um, as it helps them, helps certainly people like me, identify this kind of feel this field of feeling that's taking place in bodies, like heart rate variability, for example, um, and that many groups of people, many different kinds of people are interested in theorizing for particular ends. So for example, you have actors like engineers, emotional AI researchers, technology innovators, social media companies, as well as social scientists like myself, who are interested in making affect, that is the sensations and modulations that take place in bodies and between bodies, trying to make these uh, affects legible or quote unquote knowable for different ends. So you can hopefully see how this term affect um, to some degree, because it is such a difficult field of sensations to pin down because it's rather ambiguous, um, can become a highly political or socially contested category. And indeed it can become a realm of, of potential, we might say affective potential or feeling potential for profit or power or knowledge in which many people can invest, um, including to make a, a reflexive point here, anthropologists who are interested in writing and researching and, and maybe in some ways building careers off of this concept of affect. So 
I've tried to outline here how different researchers, engineers, and corporations might be interested in automating affect, uh, and then how through scientific practices to do so, they often proliferate these rather universal models of what affect and emotion are and how they work. However, I also don't want to leave the story here. I, I don't want to suggest that this world of new technologies of affect based in disciplines of psychology, effective computing, and artificial emotional intelligence are simply spreading from the West to the rest, uh, like McDonald's, Hollywood, or these other classic commodities associated with so-called theories of Westernization or Americanization that anthropologists often talked about uh, more often than the last couple of decades than they do now. So I want to leave um, that discussion of affect here for a moment and place it in a new context. Um, basically, place it in sort of a more classically cultural anthropological context, bring us back to Japan and see what the term might um, mean and how it might change based on how um, feelings are differently imagined in various contexts of human technology relations in Japan. So in other words, I want to look now at what the people we study as anthropologists have to say about affect themselves. Uh, and for this, I want to turn to a different robot, the robot Lovat or Raboto by the company Groove X. So this is Lovat or Raboto, a robot released in 2019 and built for no other reason, according to the company Groove X, than to be, quote unquote, loved by you. So here's an example of how Lovett experiences or quote unquote models affect. Um, just replugging my own technology back in a second, just a, just a moment. Okay. So if you press Lovett's nose that you see featured here, after a moment, it will vibrate. Um, Love its giant LED eyes will then go a little cross-eyed and then its head shakes from side to side a bit. All of this seems to signify that the robot doesn't exactly like having its nose touched, but it does like the attention. Uh, in fact, this point is, is quite crucial. Um, so Love is designed to give and receive affection. Uh, to do so, the robot needs to be able to signal affection to its owner in the kind of form of feedback as well as register and record signs of affection from humans in a programming language, which is intelligible to the robot's internal processors. So a haptic signal and sensor in Lovett's nose does this perfectly. Uh, even better, it has the capacity to pair the signal with facial recognition technology so that Lovett knows exactly who is sending the message and is thus able to rank this person um, among Lovett's list of human agents stored in its database which can currently store up to 1,000 faces. So as company employees, as well as GrooveX advertisements suggest, when Lovett recognizes a face ranked high on its list, uh, its database of recorded faces, it will then seek out affection from that person first, in essence, drawing on the robot's trademarked uh, emotion technology to equip Lovett with a kind of agency expressed as preference. Um, so this is just uh, some marketing by Love It. And we can see the, the robots here potentially in kind of a, uh, a scenario of, of perhaps parenting uh, or maybe a pet-like uh, scenario. So um, Love It also has, has many other capacities other than the facial recognition technology and this haptic feedback. Uh, it can, in fact, map out its home using the camera, 360 degree camera, which is installed on its quote unquote horn on the top of its head. Uh, again, it can read facial expression, which is again, based on Ekman's model of emotions. Although according to engineers I spoke with, this capacity is not yet turned on in the robot, but it does have the capacity. And it has a growing list of specific gestures, um, such as waving its flipper-like hands in order to evoke a feeling of effect, affection from users. So this simulation of a special kind of affective experience, as well as agency, somewhat human, but purposefully not all too human, is key to GrooveX's aim to design a robot that was, quote unquote, born to be loved by you. So uh, in short, Love it is designed to offer comfort based on the model of a pet 
but it also draws on the imagination of fictional companion species in Japan. So Lovett's designer, Hayashi Kaname, is adamant that Lovett not replace humans. Uh, Hayashi has actually achieved notoriety first for his work on SoftBank's Pepper. He worked on the design team for Pepper. Um, and he reportedly left Soft SoftBank in disappointment at some of Pepper's shortcomings. So as modeling companion robots after humans, uh, um, Kanami thinks, or Hayashi thinks, will inevitably invite expectations that are impossible to meet, Kanami set out to build something entirely new. Uh, he assembled an enormous amount of investment to realize this ambition and then spent over three years experimenting with different robot designs. Finally, he was able to realize his dream of leveraging the engineering of business to, as he says, increase the power of love in the world. So that Hayashi realized this power of love, not by modeling it after humans, but by inventing an altogether novel species, anima animated by the latest technologies of AI, shows, at least to me, how he imagines robots can help realize a quote-unquote better society in Japan. In short, the society that is more full of love, more full of affection, and has less loneliness. Now, uh, let me offer another short ethnographic vignette with Lava in order to give an example of how Lava can both invite affective experiences, but also serve as a platform for experimenting with and making sense out of robotic forms of emotional care. Um, and this is the last uh, vignette I'll, I'll speak about today. Um, so, in an open meet and greet event with Lovett, hosted by GrooveX, and this took place actually before Lovett was released, I met a person that I'm calling Aya, uh, a woman who's in her 30s. And Aya told me that she is really anxiously waiting for a future in which humans coexist with robots. Now, for her, she didn't necessarily think this was possible in her lifetime, but when she learned about Lovett, she was elated to discover that this future she had imagined was actually within her reach. She was elated to discover um, uh, Lovat, um, even though she claimed to be uninterested in robots or technology or anything in the IT world in general. As she said to me, she was immediately, and as she describes, inexplicably moved by Lovat. She said, it's just an emotion. She said, you know about lonely people in Japan, right? And she said, I think that everyone needs to feel affection or aichaku, and everyone enjoys this feeling we can get from cute things. It fulfills your heart, uh, kokoro o mikasu. But not everyone can get this feeling. I think that in the future, maybe one or two people out of 10 might simply have relationships with things like lava. It's not really any different from the kind of affection one gets from a dog or a cat, she said, or even another person. And it's their choice. This is a really interesting future, uh, end quote there. Um, so Aya's comments are interesting to me as it shows how experimental technolog technological platforms like Raboto that appeal to human affect are being used to kind of test from the perspective of companies what people want out of their interactions with robots with so-called artificial emotional intelligence uh, or simply from robots with the capacity to engage emotionally with humans. That is to say, although there are traceable histories in Japan about how roboticists have imagined what kinds of emotional roles robots should play in society, with a growing market for emotional robots, there is also an important aspect of experimentation being conducted within the framework of consumer capitalism. So robots like Lava, especially given their non-human form, evoke and elicit reactions that, precisely because they are new and experimental, evoke affects, these feelings in the body, that don't yet have these specific interpretive frameworks or stories tied to them. So while some possible frameworks and stories exist, drawing on anime, manga, um, uh, literature, new ones are also being invented. Um, and that's why I think now is a particularly important time to look at how people are responding to some of these new technologies. Um, so my work is trying to join uh, the work of many other people, Hirofumi Katsuno uh, and Ellison, James Wright, who are doing uh, and have been doing for many years very good work on 
uh, how the incorporation of new technologies like this in Japan are generating new imaginaries of how people might relate emotionally with technologies and via those technologies with other people in turn. So here we are seeing how feelings circulating between humans and robots are understood not as reflecting a model of universal human affect that is rooted in universal theories of emotion, like in Ekman's theory that we discussed, um, or of emotional or evolutionary biology, like in some evolutionary psychological um, theories. Rather, the makers and users of Raboto see feelings or affect as something that is undetermined, unfixed, and open to new possibilities because precisely the relationships that humans take with technology are also new and open and always changing. So this means that affect is not something rooted in human evolutionary history or even solely in cultural histories, but that it's something constantly changing in relationship with the technological objects we encounter, perhaps increasingly today, and the social systems in which those objects are embedded. So from this perspective, the term affect can help draw anthropologists' attention today to how the arrangement of humans, things, and environments can change how our own feelings and automatic reactions to worlds and to things are under constant processes of reconditioning and reformulation. And this perspective even leaves open the possibility for exploring the possibility that new affects and emotions might even emerge that we have not perhaps seen before. Uh, such as human robot intimacy, human robot friendship, or even as Lovatz maker Hayashi Kanami argues, love. So I want to end here by proposing to you that Japan might be one particularly rich site for these kinds of investigations. Um, but it's not necessarily unique or exceptional in this regard. Rather, for me, it represents one place among many in which we can identify a variety of diverse and politically contested attitudes concerning how humans are being affectively changed today by technology and where humans and societies are debating how they should respond as a consequence. And so I'll end it there and I very much look forward to hearing your own thoughts about some of these topics. So thank you. Oh, so we, oh, so we, Dan, you miss our applause. This is really great to talk. Thank you so much. I think we, um, I think your talk is really remind me my recent work on the heart, try to go beyond the psyche and to as a way of decolonizing affect and uh, not treating affect as a universal, you know, kind of a psychological uh, human traits, but uh, we need to really contextualize affect in a, uh, you know, sp in culturally or historically specific, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, situations. So for me, this is a this is a the kind of work, I, you know, I really appreciate you are doing to, to, to you know try to, um, you know, decolonize both affect and technology in Japan. Try to debunk some of the um, kind of um, a secret or mythology about Japan. Japanese technology or the notion of affect. I really appreciate. So um, I have quite a few questions, but I would like to open up to let people, to, um, let, you know, uh, students uh, in sitting, people sitting here and those people online to read their question. Um, yeah, please just uh, those online, you this, I saw you, Allison. Uh, and Alison, you, this are you the uh, the editor of culture anthropology from Duke? <laughs> Thank you. I'm I'm no longer no longer. Oh but my! Goodness. We read your article. This, this. Yes. But, yeah. But, please. But may I ask a question? Yes, Dan, please. That was, that was fabulous. That was that was so exciting. Um. And, you know, the, the question that I would have would be, how does this play into what's also happening with in-person relations on the ground? I mean, as we know, things are, are hard and socially precarious in Japan. So, and, and you, you speak so beautifully and kind of optimistically about the, the potential 
that robotic interactions can have. And I, I like that. I, I think that's, uh, and Ji Yang, I mean, I think that you speak to the same, you know, the same kind of utopic potential. But I wonder if you could kind of flesh this out, thinking about on the ground, you know, in-person relations and, and how does that, you know, I mean, could, could you just speak a little bit more to that? But kudos, this is just fabulous work. It was so, so exciting. It's, it's just really wonderful. Thank, thank you. you, Anne. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. Um, obviously, I think like me and a lot of us here, we've we've drawn inspiration from your own work, drawing attention to um, conditions of, of loneliness in Japan, precarity. Um, and that's absolutely one of the storylines here. Um, I think if 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 I might seem to uh, um, to present an optimistic version, at least with the lecture I did today, um, one reason is I like to think is because the uh, the um, most of the people, the interlocutors that I spend time with, are optimistic themselves, and I want to present that that vision quite a bit first and foremost is maybe a rather uh, traditional anthropological <laughs> ethos that I'm somewhat committed to. At the same time, they are also very much responding to precisely that dimension that you raise of loneliness and precarity and anxiety, I think is a fair word to use here as well. Um, and an important response that they have precisely to those arguments is that these robots are not replacing other humans. They're not replacing human-human connections. They are for certain people and some people who for a whole set of reasons might at this point in time, whether because of very personal psychological traumas or histories, which are very personal, or because of, uh, as they recognize, social trends in Japan, which make it hard to connect in person and just on a person-to-person -person basis. For that reason, some of these robots might be helpful for those people. And in general, for the general public, um, who these companies and engineers reason all take desire and pleasure in affection uh, and the presence of another body, whether that be human body or robotic body, body, some body of agency, a body that expresses agency, because many people take pleasure in that. Robots like this can potentially augment humans' potential for human-to-human -human connection. And indeed, as Ayashi Konami will say, for love in general. He's not afraid of using that word. Uh, thank you. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, uh, Yudis. Mm -hmm. This is our colleague in sociology uh, here at SFU. Yudis, please. Thank you. thank you, Anne, for your question. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Dan. I really appreciate your very clear presentation. It was very clear to follow. And uh, you ended your uh, presentation with an optimistic um, uh, view and, and shares that I don't. <laughs> I have a different perspective on this. <laughs> and also, I mean, the G's um, comment about decolonization, I feel completely opposite in an opposite way. I mean, because uh, the, the algorithmic model development uh, the, and these algorithms are there to classify, to categorize um, emotions, effects, et cetera, et cetera. So, but they are data-driven. Without data, they cannot really develop models uh, to categorize things um, for machines to learn from, et cetera. So data sources are North American or European, right? They are not uh, coming from all over the world or from the globe. They are European data, American data, Canadian data perhaps, because these locations are the ones which produce data. Uh, so, so then the data production is European and American or Japanese, perhaps, or maybe Chinese. I'm not sure how what's going on there either. But the, so, how on earth these algorithms, which reflect certain um, the, the the cultural emotive or uh, whatever you call it, um, the the, uh, the the information collect you know, uh, that can be decolonizing. Uh, or can be the 
can be sort of nicely presenting a love relationship or quite an intimate, nice relationship to help elderly deal with their loneliness. I mean, I'm not sure whether, that's my question, yeah. The idea itself is very Euro-American centric. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, absolutely sympathize with your concern. And this is absolutely the reason why in most all of my presentations, presentations, even at the risk of repeating myself a bit, I do try to tell that story of Paul Ekman and the degree to which his um, theory of basic emotions and more importantly, one might say, his coding system is what has been most taken up by um, people interested in developing emotional technologies around the world. Um, so that's very important to, to note and, and that's why I'd like to start there. Um, I think it's also important to say that computer scientists themselves are aware of the limitations of that data. Um, they're very aware that, as the computer scientists Alet and Paeva often say, and I often cite, that um, computer scientists know very well that in order to automate an emotion, one has to basically choose a model which is implementable in a machine. Thus, computer scientists tend to choose those models which are most implementable in the framework. That means that it has to be one which is highly codable. And thus, as an unfortunate consequence for many anthropologists um, and many worried about um, the colonization of emotional data, um, data which is universal, right? Which seems to be universal. Um, so engineers are very aware of that. And at the same time, they're, they're also not necessarily, especially in corporations, they're not necessarily afraid of putting those models out into the wild, so to speak, just to see what kinds of data come back, because they can use that data in order to implement into subsequent iterations of their robots. And that's certainly where some of the concern comes in here, right? Um, I think it's before going further on that, it's also important to say, um, and here I'm, I'm taking good advice from Jennifer Robertson, from Erica Buffelli, who note that these robots are still in very elementary forms right now. Mm -hmm. So even though a lot of these robots can, uh, from the platform perspective, read an, an emotion on a person's face, for example, it does so incredibly poorly and only in very certain conditions and very static conditions. At the same time, it's precisely because people are experimenting with, with those technologies now that researchers like us, I think, have to take interest in them and document how people are responding to them and, and the kinds of data that people are collecting. Um, and that's part of, part of my broader project. So I think the... Um, another way to answer uh, this from an ethnographic perspective is to say that companies like Groovex, who built the company Love Up, are, are very sensitive to the conversations going on about AI and the biases of AI in the global context. They have to be aware of these for sure, and they have to address them. And so they collect all kinds of data, um, not just quantitative data that they might get through their robot platforms, but all sorts of qualitative data that they get in interviews, and surveys asking people how they think about these robots, how they're responding to robots. Mm -hmm. And from that qualitative data, they are basically trying to formulate a story, a qualitative story about what it means for people to have a relationship with a robot that also goes into their imagination of the next iterations of these robots. So people, despite the kinds of of concerns we might have on the quantitative data being collected by these robots, these companies, and again, I'm trying to present the perspective of my interlocutors here. Um, to address those concerns, they also try to incorporate the feedback from their customers, which are often, it's fair to say, and here's a point of cultural difference here, are much more optimistic in Japan than they are elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a good number of people in Japan who are very concerned about the development of these robots and many who are excited about their possibilities. And those stories of excitement and optimism are the kind that uh, these corporations are trying to integrate into the next iterations and narratives about what these robots are for and the kinds of data they might collect. May I follow up on that, Jules? Uh, yeah. 
So thank you. Uh, the the other side of this, so if you continue a little bit on that, um, uh, the data. Um, these are all data intensive uh, the, the the technologies, and they rely on data processes clearly. Uh, data have to be uh, measurable, right? And uh, to be uh, to make those quantitative and qualitative data measurable, uh, you have to have proxies. So when you have the work with proxies, uh, uh, because I mean you don't have as much data to correspond to a measurement really. So as a result, proxies are used. Um, uh, so then you say uh, qualitative data is also gathered through interviews, etc. Fine, but they have to be converted into measurable data often by use of proxies. So I feel that actually, I'm afraid that actually in the process, what we will end up having uh, formalized and standardized uh, representation of emotion, effects, et cetera. And that is in a Weberian sense, is a very dangerous path for me. This is how I see that, yeah. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Um, and I think that's why we uh, also need as many studies as possible, which study exactly that process of coding and tagging emotional data to see exactly what happens at that translation point between qualitative into the quantitative so very much appreciate take your take your point thank you thank you mm -hmm. thank you we have another question from joffrey Nielsen. yeah thank thanks for for having me thanks uh dan your talk was really great um i'm not a, a anthropology student i'm a uh a graduate student in the English department at SFU, um, but um, I wanted to discover some new things, so I, I came to your talk, and I'm learning a lot. Um, there's one one thing that I, I've been really concerned with AI products in in general, um, and kind of picking up on this comment about the utopic potential of of these technologies in society. Um, this this Lovat robot that you do you talk in a lot about in your presentation and its slogan born to be loved by you i kind of hear that as born to be purchased by you um and what is the danger of supplying a a product um an effective robot to solve a social and political problem of precarity and loneliness yeah that's a fantastic way to frame that that's that's very nice um yeah there's um again as as many uh, anthropologists who have worked on these issues before me in this field and uh, again a few of them are, are here today notably Anne Ellison will, will say all of this takes place within a field of capitalism within consumerism um and so these big questions about should people interact with robots? Should people seek care from technologies in addition to or instead of humans? All of these big debates are taking place within a marketplace where certain voices have more publicity over others, right? And so a company like GrooveX can market, so to speak, that might be the right word here, can market or publicize and publicize in the in the sense of not just market but also make public its story of how people should engage with these robots more than others right um so one could could definitely take a sort of a, a pessimistic or constructively critical view of that and say okay this is being done for the sake of profit um i think my interlocutors from GrooveX might respond that there perhaps is no no escape from that marketplace, especially in contemporary Japan. Um, and they are willing to work within a space where, um, as one part of what the market provides, there is a technology like LoveUp that can provide a sense of comfort um, via presence that is actually not as intrusive as other technologies because it's not necessarily working through le human language like a robot like pepper would or even powdered oat would um, it doesn't yet speak human language it can register proof says a few 
um, human words in order to respond to. But in this sense, the robot is designed specifically as what Paul Roquette might describe as a sort of affective technology or mood regulating technology. A robot which is there to, to uh, share space with you and thus be a sort of a form of comfort that because it's not engaging with you in, in language and text-based natural language processing uh, is, might be slightly more open um, to definition by users or consumers in terms of what kind of relationship they might they might have. Um, again, because you pose the question as one of of sort of marketing and and capitalism, I'm trying to present the response what I imagine my interlocutors would say to that. Um, but very much your concern is one that many people in Japan also share, and that's important to note as well. It's also important to note that there's many psychologists in Japan. Uh, many of whom we've we've had workshops with, where we invited Groovex staff and psychologists to get together and have discussions. And these psychologists in Japan absolutely voiced their concern that these robots were being used, particularly with children, particularly with children with developmental disabilities, um, as uh, something that might not be constructive for these children's relationships with other humans, but might actually be disadvantageous to constructing positive relations with other humans. So there's absolutely those criticisms as well. Thank you for your answer. Uh, yes, I want to give the opportunity to one of our students here. Thank you, uh, Dan. Thank you, Je uh, Jeffrey. And uh, yes, Max, you can come and then probably, yes. So this is a well one. <laughs> Oh, yeah, this class here. Correct. Yes, <laughs> sit here. All right. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hello. Um, I was um, doing some of uh, another piece I read on the kind of growth of animal cafes in Japan, kind of as a result of this kind of social precarity and kind of instability that you were talking about. And I was kind of thinking while well, listening to this talk, like where do animals fit in with, or like pets fit in with this whole idea of like robots or kind of that like affection between humans and like something else. Yeah, I was just kind of wondering like what, someone might say, oh, why not just have a cat? Like what would be like some of the reasoning that you found in your work that might kind of relate to that? Absolutely, yeah, that's a fantastic question, Max, thank you. Um, so I'll give you one very specific answer to that question. Um, why not a cat or a dog? Many people would actually prefer a cat or a dog in Japan over a robot, um, but many people living in urban Tokyo and in small apartments actually just can't have them. They're not allowed to, <laughs> and it's not very practical either. Um, and so very much in recognition of that, people at GrooveX responded in part with this robot Lover, which is very purposefully not a humanoid looking robot like the robot Pepper issued by SoftBank. It's more of a pet-like robot. But at the same time, it's also not a pet-like robot like Sony's Ivo is, which clearly looks like a dog, right? So it's capitalizing, we might say, GrooveX is capitalizing off the affection people already have and have had in, in Japan for a long time for pets. And I would appoint people to Paul Hansen's work in this in, in general. Um, and also very much Patrick Galbraith's work, who, who might be the person you, you were reading and noting with uh, animal cafes and also made cafes overlap with that quite a bit. Um, GrooveX is capitalizing off the image of uh, Lava as a sort of non-humanoid creature, drawing from both anime and manga and fictional worlds where people very commonly have intimate and fun relationships with non-humanoid and non-animal creatures, but also the, the very real desire people have for pets. So that would be one way to answer that, that question. Which is, it's a question that people in Japan have, consumers have, and that the robot engineers have as well. And so you're, you're very much thinking along their lines. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dan, I realize the time, oh, we have another question from online. 
before Arthur, and then we will um uh, we will uh, let you read the question after one of our students, graduate students, read the question. Okay, Arthur, sorry, yes, come to read. We are, we have to start time. We have people line up try to read questions until they read your articles. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Um, so I'm just wondering, what is your own affectual relationship to the robots that you're working with like? Um, we You shared the, the photo of yourself as viewed by the robot, um, and I'm curious about your own response to, to being in the presence and, and being in relationship with these um, robots in uh, a research setting and um, Casually, what what that was sure. like the embodied essence of that? Yeah. Sure, absolutely. That's that's a very fair question, a very good question for for anthropologists to ask each other, um, because so much of our data is collected through these interpersonal, very subjective means, right? Um, so there's another picture I might have shown of me holding the robot Lovat with a very sort of perplexed look on my face, um, not really sure exactly how to feel, and it's interesting because. There's another image that I saw of the former vice, of the former chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel, interacting with another robot, the robot now, um, that uh, whose reaction looked very similar to my own while holding this robot lover. And I thought, well, that's very interesting. We both seem to have these sort of reactions on our face, which would probably be very difficult for a robot to read at this point, which is a mix of feelings, I think it's fair to say. Feelings are very dynamic processes, right? They're not a static thing. They go through different stages. They go back and forth and, and things. And so this mixture of feelings, which had some like curiosity in it, but had also some perhaps some doubt, um, some ambivalence, maybe even a, a little bit of animosity um, in that facial expression, I think captured something that's very important about emotion, which is that Again, it's a dynamic thing, which can't be captured in single snapshots by artificial intelligence and put into a, a data point um, quantitatively. Um, so what that image also showed for me was that I too consciously have a sort of ambivalence about these robots. I'm not in any way a robot fan. I don't live with a robot. I don't particularly want a robot. My research colleague, Hiro Fumi Katsuno, um, has one of these robots, love it, and has lived with it, with his family. Um, and so both of us have actually different emotional reaction to these robots in general. And that's something which is quite constructive for our research because we bring different attitudes to the data as well and can sort of triangulate that a little bit. So I'm more interested in these robots because I'm fascinated by how the modeling of emotion in technological platforms can transform how we understand human emotionality in general, and perhaps even transform those emotions. And it's really out of that curiosity that I got interested in this project. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello. Um, thank you for your talk. I learned so much. I am not an anthropology graduate student, I'm a sociology graduate student, and I must admit that I align very closely with um, Yildiz Adesoy and as well as Jeffrey with these concerns of late capitalism. <laughs> um, and I'm really curious about, I wanna be respectful of the position of your interlocutors as well as yourself um, and this anthropological penchant to be true to the optimism that's shared by your participants. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm really curious about how love is being used and defined in these contexts, because I mean, the complications of, of care and love and dependency with technology is of great concern for me, especially in reading black feminist literature and like what utopia looks like in another way using community care and reparations. And so I'm curious, about what love looks like for this? Is it affection, emotion, what's going on? Yeah, um, what a great question. So you, I think you did a very nice way frame that question very <laughs> diplomatically and sensitively because it is such a difficult 
concept and, and difficult area. Um, love is entirely infused with political histories um, which distribute love um, asymmetrically, I think it's fair to say. Um, and so Gruvac's staff, especially people who are as public as Hayashi Kaname is, in trying to publicize a certain story of human robot relationships is treading very, uh, I won't say treading what I would say, he's, he's walking a very thin line here between giving a positive sort of vision of an all-inclusive form of love that includes both robots and humans, but that also may exclude certain humans over others based on certain histories in Japan in particular. And so actually we'll have a, an article on precisely this topic coming out on Anthropology News, hopefully in another few months about um, how the future of quote unquote diversity in Japan may in fact in its optimistic incorporation of robots into that vision may also potentially be sacrificing certain human forms of love. Um, Japan has a history as again many other anthropologists have shown Jennifer Robertson, James Wright, Elena Knox of um, government investment in technological solutions over certain human solutions. For example, um, seeking to invest in robots in the care sector for elderly care before welcoming care workers um, from outside Japan, such as in Southeast Asia, in order to fill a deficit of care workers in Japan. So in this case, we see how perhaps a technological optimism sacrifices um, a, a kind of diversity and inclusion um, that focuses more on certain kinds of humans. Mm -hmm. So for that reason, I very much appreciate your, your question, but come back to me if I haven't uh, gotten to the heart of it. I mean, I wanna be respectful of people's time and I will definitely keep an eye out for that article. I will just leave it maybe in, in the way of um, saying that when I hear optimism in these senses, I can't help but think of Lauren Berlant's cruel optimism. And so that's my lens of, of listening through this, but thank you. Yeah, I- yeah. Thank you for that cruel optimism. I think one of my favorite academic phrases of turn in the past decade. Yes, me too. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, good. Thank you. We have, yeah, Asa, sorry for waiting, for keeping yeah, waiting. It's okay. Um, hi, I'm, I'm a sociology undergraduate student here. Um, my question would be that, like, given if, you know, how people have been talking about how, like, uh, the use date of ChatGPT, something like a type of AI in the academic sources, and how, like, they're constituting academic honesty and all that sort. Um, I'm wondering, like, what you thought about how the nationalization of AI between people and AI, when the interaction between human and AI kind of get compl overcomplicated in, in the in the sense of like people don't know which one is the AI, which one is the human. Do so you think that is it possible, like, um, that the technology, like the one you mentioned with the love bot and all that, uh, would it get to that point with the nationalization of AI? It, we, we think that. It, partially could be partially dangerous so people don't understand you're gonna count different between a human or another animal or another uh or AI that would that complicate the relationship between people in general. Yeah, thank you for that, Arthur. Um so this is yeah definitely uh uh, a concern on a lot of people's minds with the latest iterations of chat GPT. I know a lot of <laughs> teachers are struggling with this themselves and how to delineate the human and machine academic assignment submissions <laughs> and things like that. Um, I'm always tempted to, I mean, um, I'm always tempted to, to see my role as, as trying to present the different positions of the people I spent time with. Um, so I know that can sometimes be not a very satisfying answer and maybe appear underly critical. And for that reason, I appreciate all the very constructively critical questions that I've received today. Um, so, but in, in sort of holding to that commitment to representing those interlocutors' perspectives, um, 
I think I would say that for there's there's a big difference between people who are are dealing in the area of AI and people who are dealing with embodied robots. And for the people dealing with the latter, which is mostly what I talked about today, for them, they are very much in favor of featuring robots as a part of uh, human society in a way that sees them as not human, but as also not necessarily a machine, as a third category or as a new category of something that can support or augment um, care in society more broadly, whether that is between humans and humans or between humans and concept of society at large or between humans and other non-human animals living or not living. So from that point of view, they would be interested in using artificial intelligence to enhance the ability of those robots to engage emotionally with humans. At the same time, they understand and um, they understand the concern of others that the kinds of technologies that go into those embodied robots are also ones which are advancing in non-embodied terms and that, which are, are being implemented every day today. For example, if you go uh, online and you try to get an answer to a question you want for your healthcare or a product that you purchased and you're talking with a chatbot and you may have trouble discerning whether that chatbot is a human or not. And there's a whole category of concerns and questions to, that's important to to be concerned about there. Um, so I would say that in this field of embodied robot care, this is one of the many different dimensions that this problem of advancing AI plays out in. And I think one important thing that social scientists and, and students of AI, like many of us are here, can do is to try to make distinctions and disambiguate the different problems that come up in these different scenario so that we're not all treating AI as one specific problem that becomes a different problem with different dimensions in each of these different contexts. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Could, uh, Dan, could, we, uh, could you answer uh, the last two questions? We have students already lie up here. I know we ran out of time. We we tried to take advantage of you. So um, yeah, Jericho, could you come to, to ask a question? So this is the last question. We we'll finish. Let you go. Yeah, come. Hey, thanks for talking. Uh, oh. My question has kind of already been asked in some capacity already. Um, but so if anything, it's more of a clarifying question. And I do want to make my position clear from the jump. I'm very skeptical about, I guess, what we've termed as the utopic, optimistic potential these robots have toward cultivating more fulfilling emotional or affective relations amongst humans. And you might call this a more pessimistic line of thinking, and I'll embrace that. Um, so along this more pessimistic line of thinking, I do want to hear you speak more on the potential for co-optation, given that, as you understand, as we all understand as anthropology and sociology students, um, we live under capitalism. Um, so I guess my question would be what precautions are in place to the end of ensuring these technologies are used to, quote, augment human relations as opposed to being used to supplant human relations uh, and line the pockets of the co corporations that supply them? Uh, yeah, great question. Um, so. Um, in terms of what's being put in place now, so Japan, like any other place, has uh, telecommunications laws that people have to abide by and companies have to abide by. So um, these companies have privacy policies, which are pretty extensive. Um, and I think that they, actually the, the best and most direct answer to that question is found in those policies. And um, that's why you probably need anthropologists and sociologists who are better than I am at uh, explaining what those policies mean in actual social and practical terms. Um, because the, tr the, the trick about AI, and I think this was captured both in your question and the last question, is that because this sort of new territory, something like chat GPT, sort of new territory in communications language and 
communications uh, legal categories that oftentimes these companies can operate outside of those previous regulations for a while because these technologies are in a very, very gray area. Um, so in some ways, your, your question is, is incredibly important because with AI technologies, it's, it's hard to sometimes regulate new technologies outside of older technologies that are being imperfectly applied to them. Um, so try to get a little bit more specific um, so as far as I understand, based off my last conversations with Google X staff, something like facial emotion recognition that a robot like Google X um, has equipped in Lova, basically the robot has this capacity in the software, but the function is not turned on yet because for Google X staff, they're not certain that that can be uh, justified in terms of privacy nor are they sure that that's a popular function <laughs> that customers want. Um, maybe customers might be okay to that more in Japan than other places. It's something that the um, company has to explore a bit more. Although to be honest, Groovex has now focused more on the Japanese market rather than the foreign market, probably in part in response to some of the concerns raised by you that people just aren't as receptive to these technologies and have concerns about them more outside Japan than they do inside Japan. So that's one sort of imperfect way to, to address your question. No, thank you for, for that. 